Okay, hey, um, our, my little helpers here, Sophia and um, Amani, are going to come around and hand you a little sheet of paper, because I thought we'd go old school today. I thought, who wants a boring PowerPoint when you can have an actual sheet of A4 paper in your hand, right? <laughs> Woo! Um, so that's what you're getting. You're getting a little sheet of A4 paper that um, I just want to talk through. In fact, Sophia, you better leave me one up here, because I won't know what I'm talking about unless... So they'll get around it in a second. Now, whilst they're going around um, giving you this, what, what I want to start by saying is this. What is the job of a pastor in a church? It's a good question to ask. And I guess there's various ways you could answer that question. But certainly, there's two responsibilities that myself and Pastor Ike have for this church. And they, they probably could simply be described as this. We're responsible for leading and feeding. Leading and feeding the sheep that God has put in our care. Leading and feeding. If anyone needs one, um, everyone got one that wants one? Oh, just at the back there, Sophia. Just pop up your hand if you still get a sheet and the girls will come round. So leading and feeding. Now really today, what I want to share with you all is some thoughts about how I believe the Lord has led myself, Ike, to lead the church, to make sure that as a flock, we're going in the right direction. Now, on this sheet of paper, I'm going to chat through it very kind of briefly with you today. But what's contained in this little double-sided A4 paper is really what the Holy Spirit has laid in my heart for our church for the next number of years. And I, I'm quite excited to share it with you today. Let me start off by recapping what I shared last week. For those that weren't here last week, I talked about an emergency that's unfolding in this city before our very eyes. I talked about the, the desperate rate of church attendance we have in the city of 5.7%, which puts us at the lowest church attendance across anywhere in Scotland, which means if you work that um, through to its conclusion, logically, it means that there's more people dying in this city, distant from God, than anywhere else in Scotland. Makes sense. I talked about, I think it was over 2,000 people each year die in Aberdeen, but only about 130 of them or so are churched. So if we're being serious about what we say and what we preach and what we teach, we have to acknowledge the fact that the majority of these people are probably destined to spend an eternity in hell, separated from God. Now, I phrased that as an emergency last week, and it is an emergency. It's not one that's in the media. It's not one that's in the news. It's not one that's even talked about that much outside these four walls, perhaps. But in the eyes of the Lord... And the eyes of this church were in the midst of an emergency in our local community. So what is our response going to be? Well, this is really what I want to talk to you about today. Hear his heart. Hear his heart. You'll hear that three words quite a lot this morning. Here's the mission. Last week I said this. It's not so much does your church have a mission. It's does the mission of God have a church. That's pretty much the fundamental point. Does the mission of God have a church? Like We're not in the business of making up something off the top of our heads for us to achieve as a church. Rather, we're looking to the Bible and being led by the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, how can we as a church help contribute towards the mission that you've set for your church 2,000 years ago? To go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the mission that the Lord set out for his church. And that was obviously in here in very simple terms. So in other words, he's called his church to act as an early warning system. Last week I described the devastating floods in Libya. Many of the lives were lost because there wasn't an adequate early warning system in place. And we compared that to just now. How many people are dying, ending up an eternity separated from God in hell because partly... There's not an adequate early warning system in place in this city, and that falls on our shoulders as a church. We have got a part to play 
and sounding a siren. So this is how I would articulate the mission that we are going to have at Silver City Church in the coming years. I put five years here. I must admit, it's a little bit of a figure, not plucked from thin air, but I'm not sure if this will take us five years or three years, perhaps. I'm not sure. We live next door to uh, Carney Wood, which is a place just around the corner. It's devastated by uh, winds and storms recently, and all the trees fell down. So they've redone the paths. And um, they initially said, this is going to take eight weeks to do it. And you know what? They finished in five. And I, I was thinking to myself, who is that builder or contractor who did an eight-week job in five weeks? It hardly ever happens. So a good place to start. So I'm not sure if this is going to take the full five years. But here's what I do know. And this is a, a nice quote that I heard someone once say. They said, most churches overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10. And I think that's true. Most churches think we can achieve all of this in one year, but in 10 years, well, they probably underestimate what they can achieve. So this is just an attempt to put a time frame on what I think our mission is going to take to achieve. And this is what the mission is. Very simply, it's that as a church, we would give every person in our community an opportunity to hear his heart. To give every person in our community an opportunity to hear his heart. Now, you know I'm a sucker for a nice little tagline or a strap line, but I hope it's more than that. Because contained within this little sentence, I think it actually hooks in to the heart of God for our church and this city and our community to let every person in our community have an opportunity to hear his heart. Last week, I described how I don't think the problem is so much that people are hearing the gospel and rejecting it. I think, sadly, the problem is that people aren't even hearing the gospel in this generation. So we've got kids going to school who have got no idea what's taught in the Bible. Like you would mention Adam and Eve, and they would think, who on earth are they? Noah's Ark, no idea. Jonah and the whale, what? So the kids, young people, and older than that too, are growing up and living in a world where the concept of biblical Christianity as we would understand it is nowhere on their radar. So this is where we're at as a community. And this is why this heart behind this is so important, that we would give every person in this community an opportunity to hear his heart. Turn it over the page and let me break that down simply for us. Every person, this is why this is important. Every person. Do you know that every person is important to God? There's not one human being that has ever existed that hasn't been important to God. He created us all. Now, he created us all differently. He created us all different colors, different ages, different cultural backgrounds, different geographical locations. But every single person in this world is precious to God. And his heart is that no one would perish, but everyone would be saved. So every single person in our community is important to God. They're precious to him. Now, when you think about it, really, when you start to think about, well, who is in this community if we divided every person? I think you could more or less capture everyone under three different titles. Outside this church building, there's going to be people living in this community. So people that live in these houses that surround this church, we've got people living here. And we've got people working in this community. So there's businesses all over this place. You know, Rosemont Place has got loads of different businesses. Next door, the kilt shop. Whenever anyone asks me, oh, what church are you at? I say, Silver City Church. And they say, oh, I'm not sure where that is. I say, do you know the kilt shop? Uh, Georgian Dress Hire. They say, yeah. I say, next door to that. So we've got, like, businesses all over this community. We've got people studying in this community. So you've heard me talk about some of them. The students at the grammar school. We've got Gilcomston Primary School, Skeen Square Primary School. We've got literally hundreds of students living in this area, many of whom will never have heard the gospel. 
So we've got people living, studying, and working in this community. So our dream, now our goal is just a dream with work clothes on. So our dream and our goal is that every single person, and I mean, like, get me when I say this, I mean like every single person living in this community, working in this community, studying in this community, over the next three to five years, through what we do, we'd have a chance to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus. That's audacious. It's a big goal. It's a big thing to say. Now, I've came out with some big things before in the life of this church, and sometimes I think, Dave, what have you done? And this is maybe another one of those moments. But you know what? I don't want to be a part of a church that thinks small, that doesn't, you know, that, that thinks we can only achieve what we can achieve on our strength and on our power. Because let me tell you, like, God's not put off by this dream. That's his heart for every single person here to have a chance to respond to his gospel. That's the heart of Christ. That's why he came to the cross. He wants the whole world to know. Now, I get that this is like, whew, this might be a big thing to try and get your head around. That's okay. We don't have to achieve it tomorrow. But every single person. Okay, the next little bit in the sentence is like our community. Let's put up this slide. As I've been thinking about it, praying about it, this is what the Lord's laid in my heart that, that encompasses our community. When I say our community, what does that actually mean in black and white? I think this is what the Lord's put in my heart, this area geographically in our city. Now, here we are there, Silver City Church. So you can see how like densely populated an area is you know, we're in the city center. So it's like, there's a lot of people there. Lots of houses. But it's, it's like a diverse area, isn't it? Look, you've got the park at the top left, Victoria Park. And um, down here, you've got the grammar school. A little bit further along, you've got Gilcomston Primary. Up in the top right, you've got Skeen Square. You've got loads of businesses all over the place. And what also excites me is, now, I know you're thinking, Dave, why is there a little cutout bit? That looks a bit odd. What's that all about? Here's why that's there. Does anyone know what that little cutout bit is? Geographically. It's Woolman Hill Student Halls. Now, I'm thinking, for the sake of the line, surely we can't, like, cut out hundreds of students just because the line's on that road. We need to move the line over a little bit, right? Now, so I've, I've encompassed that area. But here's why that's encouraging, right? On Friday, I read, right in that little bit here, here, the council have just approved a seven-story uh, student apartment that's got a house 300 to 400 students. Like, literally, like, five minutes walk from this building, there's going to be a new building built, seven stories. Wouldn't like to live next door, but um, three to 400 students are going to be living there. So come on, we need to encompass them into our community. So this is us. Now, I get that some of you don't live in this area. Like, we're, we're from wide and far. Like, I don't live in this area. I grew up in this area, more or less. I went to school here, so I, I know the area well. But I don't live here now, and many of you don't live in this area either. And that's okay. You don't need to live in this area to have a heart for it. But as a church... We can't escape the fact that for the last, since the 1960s, the Lord has planted us in this community. Like the Rosemount and Gilcomston areas of our city is where the Lord's geographically planted this church. So we might have bigger aims and bigger ambitions than just this one day, but let's start off with what's on our doorstep. This area, Rosemount and Gilcomston, to let every person in our community have an opportunity to hear and respond to his heart. Let me move on and just share a little bit about what here his heart is. So the Bible, it tells us in Romans 1.16, it says, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And thank God it's the gospel. Thank God it's not my preaching, or whether we have a worship team, or how nice this building is. 
or whatever you want to add on to the end of that sentence. It's the gospel of Christ. That is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And so as a church, what we want to be about is this is our product. Our product's not like slick preaching or nice worship leading or how good we execute certain things. Our product is the gospel of Christ, basically. That's what we stand for. That's the heart of our message. And this is what we want to communicate to the world. Now, essentially, as I mulled it over, as I've went through it a hundred times in my head, I believe there's four foundational truths at the moment that the Holy Spirit's laid in my heart that, that are going to be powerful as we communicate these wider. And they're written down here. He created you. So this is what people will read or get when we communicate. He created you. People need to know that. People need to know that they're not just a, as, you know, a, a fluke occurrence from millions and billions of years of evolution with no kind of forethought behind it. They need to know that there was a creator behind their life because it gives them purpose. It gives them an identity. We live in a culture that has an identity crisis. People need to know who they are in Christ, that Jesus created them. They need to know that he loves them. This is a question of value, of worth. There's a lot of people that don't feel like they have any worth today. So people need to know and realize that Jesus loves them. Now, we take that for granted because we hear it every Sunday. And we think, yeah, 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 boring, boring, boring. What's the next sermon series going to be on? I've dealt with Jesus loving me. Listen, this is like the bedrock of our faith. If you think you've graduated from that class, think again. And we need to communicate this truth to people who have never heard that Jesus has loved them. This is so basic to us, but to people who don't know Jesus, it's transformational. It might be the only time in their lives that they get told that someone actually loves them, that they care. It's a question of value. People need to know that Jesus died for them. And why he died for them. And that is offensive to the world. But we're not called to try and be like all chummy chummy and, you know, never ruffle any feathers. This is a message that a lot of people will reject and won't like. But nevertheless, this is the power of salvation, the gospel. That Jesus went to a cross, hung on it for us and died. And dealt with our sin and our shame. People need to know that. And lastly, he's waiting for your response. We need to be skillful and intentional about creating opportunities for people to respond to the gospel. Not just to hear it perhaps in some arbitrary way, but like bring definite points of decision for people to make. Now, it's not our job for them to decide to follow Jesus or become a Christian. I, I guess you know, that's up to God in many ways and the Holy Spirit working in their lives. But it is our job to let them have a chance to respond. That is our job for sure. There's going to be a lot of people that reject it, that don't listen, that say, no, I'm not interested in what you have to say. And that's fine. But we can't say that we've done our part until we've actually given them a chance to respond. So people need this chance to respond. So the heart, hear his heart, he created you, he loves you, he died for you, and now he's waiting for your response. He's opened his heart to us. Are we going to open our heart to him? So, lastly, how can you get involved? Pray. Every great move of God is preceded by prayer. I read a great article this week, brilliant article that listed all the great revivals throughout certainly the last couple of hundred years, if not further. And it talked about how every single move of God is preceded by prayer. And it was like, wow. So in all honesty, as a church, we need to up our prayer game in this church to, to achieve a mission like this. We need to like increase the fervency of our prayer probably how often we're praying, how often we're coming together corporately and what we're doing privately. Our prayer life needs to expand because that's going to be a key to behind a lot of the, these things. Now, thank God, we've already seen 
some beautiful answers to prayer already. But can you imagine if, like, we weren't happy with that, we're not satisfied with that, we're going for more. And we pray like no one's ever prayed in this church before. I would like to see what would happen. Giving, there's absolutely no doubt about it that the resources that we would need to achieve this mission, they definitely outstrip our current resources. So at the moment, we, we kind of barely get by, if I'm being honest. So there's no margin in our budgets. So like if we were a business to come out with a goal like this, we'd be like, oh, what on earth are you doing creating a goal like this with what you have in your bank account? It wouldn't be a, maybe a very sensible thing. But we're not a business. We're, we're an organism. We're part of the body of Christ. And listen, God's work done in God's ways will never, ever lack God's resources. So the question is, is this God's work? Of course it is. To go into the world and tell them about Jesus, 100%. God's ways. Are we looking to do it in a biblical way that honors God? Yes, we are. So I've got no problem at all standing in front of you as a pastor with not much clue about how this will happen, but to say, as we do this, God is going to open up resources for us that we haven't yet discovered. And I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about people, about you know, our energy, our time, people with different skills and abilities that we're going to need along the way to help us achieve this goal of letting every person in our community have an opportunity to hear his heart. So God's work done in God's ways will never lack God's resources. And then thirdly, I've just put down here, serving. Join one of the three teams. Now, we haven't set these up yet, but we will shortly. We'll probably set up like a working group that, that thinks about how can we engage with people who live in this community? So maybe you've got a particular burden for people that live in this community. It might be like the thing that sparks to life when you read this. Yep. I want to be involved in the people who live here. And there'll be other people like that too. So we'll say, okay, come together and let's think creatively. What can we do then? How, how can we do this? How can we make sure that every single household in this area gets a chance to hear his heart in the next five years? I don't know the answers to that yet, but I'm interested to find out what we come up with. You might think like working is the thing that like sparks to life. I've got a heart for the businesses in this area. I've got a heart for the you know, the business owners, the workers, the employees, I want to work with them. Well, same thing with studying. So we'll give you more information about how you can get involved in this. But it's going to be exciting. Like, I'm a big believer that every single person in this church has a part to play. Sometimes we professionalize Christianity and we think, oh, it's just the people that come to the front, the pastors, the worship leaders. Every single person at Silver City Church has got a role to play in achieving this mission. Whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're healthy, whether you're unhealthy, whatever it is, you've got a part to play. If you've got breath in your lungs, you've got a part to play. Okay, I want to read something out. Hey, I wonder, is everyone boiling in here or is it just me? Too warm. What, will we turn the heating down? I wasn't sure if it was just the, you know, the Holy Spirit or something, or whether it was like me just going through the menopause. But I was thinking, <laughs> I was looking out thinking, he's looking a little bit warm. Now, I'm going to give you a little minute to digest some of this just now. And I might give you, even open it up quickly for any questions or comments, because I'm interested to hear what you have to think. But let me tell you what's, what happened this morning. It was a bit unusual. Most of you that know me well know that I'm not very good at getting up early, right? Naturally, I'm a night owl, so I usually nearly every morning wake up with my alarm clock. Nearly every morning. This morning, though, I didn't. I woke up, and... I don't want to make this sound anything more than it is, but I heard someone say the name David in my room. And, um, and I'm not saying it's the voice of God or anything, because I don't think it was. Um, I, it might have been an angel. I don't think it was the voice of God. But I actually said, yes. And because I, I thought it might be Ashley, and she was fast asleep, so it wasn't Ashley. But anyway, it woke me up, and I just thought, well, 
you know, I'm probably not going to get back to sleep anyway now. I'm just going to get up. And um, I had it on my heart just to come here a bit earlier. So I just came to church a bit earlier. And I went upstairs to the upstairs room. And I was just praying a little bit, um, asking the Lord, Lord, I'm going to wait to share this this morning. You know, blah, 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 blah. Help me. Didn't really feel, you know, sometimes you just, you think, oh, your prayers are just like hitting the ceiling and bouncing back. Felt a little bit like that. But then I had this like impression, go upstairs to the loft in the church, Dave, and um, get the book. Now, many of you won't have seen this. In fact, probably no one has seen this book. Let me tell you what this book is. It's a book that has leaders' minutes from our church, right, dating back to 1946, I'm not, I'm not joking, right? So now, obviously, they didn't have MacBooks back then, so they're all like written. Can you see it? Look at that. So like, this is the the minutes of district elders meeting held at Aberdeen on Saturday the seventh, second of March, 1946. Whew. So there's. You know, there's a few of them, and then it, then it takes a break for a few decades, and then someone picks up in the 1970s randomly. But there you go. So I, the Lord kind of said, well, go up and get that book. I just I thought, okay, I will. So I got the ladder out, went up, took this book out, took it downstairs and a little bit upstairs, and just reading it. And I opened it up, and this, this little loose leaf was at the front of it. Now, I looked at this book before because I found it upstairs before. But I can't remember ever seeing this in the book before. But it just kind of stood out to me, and I, and I read through it. It's a prophecy that was given, um, I, I think, to this church, but certainly the district elders meeting back in 1974. So that's 49 years ago. And this is what it says. And as I read it, I was like, Lord, let this be true of this generation. So this is what it says. Let me read it. Now, it's, it's written in quite, you know, handwriting. So let, bear with me if I make a few slip-ups. But it says this. So, and I'll send this round later so you've got a copy of it. But it's 14th of December, 1974. I think it's 1974 rather than 1874. <laughs> this is what it says. My word is a living word from the heart of God, a powerful word not subject to human limitations. Yea, as you have gathered as servants, I would speak a word of comfort and encouragement. You look outwards, but I am the unseen. I would have you to remember there is no small beginnings in me. I'm able to take up the fallow material Clay in the hands of the potter. Channel those that are submissive by the living word. I shall yet again work out my purposes. I have kept this door open that them will yet, that there will yet be an ingathering of those I have and ascending out again to pour out around the vision. Be faithful in the place I have set you. The enemy would magnify your troubles and gloom. I would have you to discern that which derails you from my purpose. Do not despise your position. I am moving. Seek my face in your homes and intercession. I am he that seeth all. I will bring them in. From the lips, living words that shall bring them in. No need to advertise. You should be a magnet that shall draw from far and near. You shall be a magnet that shall draw from far and near. Be faithful at this time of famine, discouragement. Ye shall see the hour of God moving in your city. In your midst. Let me read that last sentence. You shall see the hour of God moving in your city. The hand of God, sorry. Let me read it again. You shall see the hand of God moving in your city. 
in your midst. Amen. 49 years ago, as I read it, I said, hey, Siri, how, how many years ago is 1974? Because I'm not very good at arithmetic. It said 49. And I thought, that's interesting. What if we're away to enter a year of the Lord's favor, a year of jubilee for this city? That Since this word was read out and administered to a district elders meeting in 1974, what if we are going to see this word come to pass in our generation? That next year, 2024, 50 years on, will be a year of jubilee where the captives are set free, where the debts are wiped out, where the prisoners get their freedom, where the sick are healed. What if? Lord God, we want to bring this word back to you. I don't believe it's a coincidence that it's been basically dropped in my lap this morning. Um, but there's so much in there, Lord, that resonates with us now, 49 years later. Not even in the same building, because these guys had a different building. But we're the same church. We're the same heart. We've got the same desire to see the lost come to know you, for them to hear your heart, for that to transform their lives and for them to be set free from a life of sin and shame, to be brought into the light, into a new creation, Lord. And Lord, you've ended that prophecy with that you shall see the hand of God moving in your city, in your midst. Well, Lord, I just ask you, remember your word. Remember the word that you gave 49 years ago to this church. I don't know if this word came to pass or not in the lives of those who got it, but I'm holding it up now, Lord, as just a, a symbol to you that we would love to see this happen in our day, for your hand to move in our city, for the lost to come in, for this place to act like a magnet to this area that would just draw people to us, not through anything that we are or what we've done or any clever kind of advertisement that is mentioned here, but just through us simply sharing the good news of Jesus with a lost and hurting world and depending fully upon your Holy Spirit to bring a transformative work that creates salvation in people. Lord, we are here. We're submitting to your ways, seeking to simply follow what you've instructed us to do. And I just pray your blessing over it, Lord. I pray for every need that we have, to potentially fulfill this mandate. Every single person, every single pound, every single lack that we currently have, Lord, we just hold it up to you and we're excited to see how you're going to respond. Because as we've just mentioned, your work done in your ways certainly not going to lack your resources. Bless you, Lord. Bless you that as we opened our service and thanked you for your goodness, Thank you that you are a good God, a faithful God. Here we have, you know, a record, physical record of your goodness over 80, 90 years perhaps in this book. So we've got something to depend on. We've got something solid. We've got experience behind us to rest upon your strength and your power, Lord. Bless you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Like I say, I'll send this round um, along with this sheet. But um, I, j I just thought it might be appropriate just to give anyone that wants to say something or ask something a chance to do that. I know that some of this is probably stuff that you'll maybe need to go away and think about and process a little bit away from here. So that's okay. But if anyone had like a burning question or something they just wanted to ask, I'd be very happy to try and Try and just talk into that if you would like. My dad, come on then, let's give you this mic. Uh, is it on, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> when David was sharing the prophecy, there was one word that came to me and just lodged itself in me, and it was the word magnet. 
Now, I'm not a physicist uh, at all, but when I think about that, <clears throat> I thought of the example of if you were just to put down a table of iron fillings, yeah, just spread it over the table, and then if you just get your magnet and you just don't touch the fillings, but you just move it over, there's something that happens. Do you know what happens? Tell me. It attracts the metal fillings. There's an unseen force at work in that whole process. And magnetism is something they still don't fully understand today. But there's something going on. As you look at it, you can't see any reason why these fillings should suddenly be attracted to the magnet. And it's because of the unseen force. And I believe for us as Christians, that is the Holy Spirit. So as we become empowered by the Holy Spirit, and as we move throughout the community, there will be something looking almost supernatural happening uh, as God begins to attract people to himself through us. So, hey, it, it's, a great, it's a great example. Anyone else have a comment or a question? Or I'll come to you in a second. I'll we'll give it to Toya. There you go. Um, good morning, church, or good afternoon. I'm not standing in a place of um, I've got this all together, but something I just want to encourage us with. You know, the word came and said, Seek my face in your home in intercession, and you shall see the hand of God move again. Um, prayer, I mean, it's not like we don't know. We all know prayer is key. It's important. The love of God is what fuels us to pray. And I um, just want to encourage us. I'm, encourage, I'm encouraging myself too. Let us understand that anything we want to see happen, it needs prayer. It's not um, reactive prayer, if that makes sense. It's the prayer that tends the land. It, it, up, you know, it, it um, the fallow ground. It turns things up. It, it, but it's a prayer that has great power. And I just want to encourage us when, when the church calls a prayer meeting, that we, we, we be there. If we're not there, where we are, we are connected to the prayer meeting. But it's not just about the church prayer meeting. It's our individual life of prayer. Um, I don't know how else to just say it, but it's <laughs> whatever we want to see done for God's kingdom, God wants it done more than we do. But prayer for some reason is the mystery, it's the outlet that he wants to use. I, I can't understand that, but that's, that's the way it is. So I just want to encourage us, please, let's, let's put prayer in the place it needs to be in our own lives individually and also corporately, yeah. That, that's it. It was just as Dave was talking about the serving thing that this came to me. Um, I was watching a wee video earlier in the week from a person some of you may know, a guy called Paul Washer, and he was talking about spiritual gifts and serving within the church. And it's basically a way that if you are serve, like if you're not serving at the moment, just find a need and go and fill it. And as it says here with the serving, you know, we're, our goal is to give everyone in our community an opportunity to hear his heart. So I would encourage you, if you're not serving in something at the moment, just go and find a need. See where there are gaps and go and fill them. You don't have to be skilled in it. You don't have to be amazing tech whiz or the most amazing cleaning person. But just if there is a need and you see it, just go and fill it. And God will bless you in ways by doing that. By sowing into the work of the church, you are sowing into the kingdom. So just be encouraged by that. And God is not just for Sundays. He wants to be in all of your life. So be encouraged, church. There are great things things yet to come. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Yeah. 
A anyone got a question or a comment? Another one? Happy to. Alex? Right. Uh, when the pastor start, start sh sharing the vision, and the one scripture come to my heart is uh, the book of Acts 2.47, and it um, says this. Hold on a minute. Sorry, because I tripped it. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So, which means is if we are on the right, uh, say, the right mind of God, the right process, uh, it, we, this is the time, this is it. We don't have to worry about to get people in. God will... Like the Frank said, the magnet. We will attract the people to the church. We attract the people. I believe the church uh, should be a beacon of hope, whatever the church is inserted. I believe the people should look at the church and our hope, or the fears, everything, they'll be solved. That's the whole point of the church. That's what we should be. People look at us as a Christians, like because we we'll, we we'll come on day that we we be different, and they're gonna look at us with the hope that we can give them something back. So uh, this is the time that God is preparing the world for the last great revival, for the last harvest. This is the time, and uh, we as a church need to stand up and be the church, not just enjoy to go to church, but this time. To be the church. And God will add the numbers daily that we cannot even count on. Because whatever we ask him, he just to give him more than we even think about it. Yeah, it's cool. So, you know, unless someone's got, does anyone else? Yeah, go on, Anula. Um, good morning, church. So just to um, add to what she said about prayer, um, I think there's a place where a number of us feel like if we have prolonged hours of prayer, that might have a lot of impact, which is quite true, right? Coming together, corporate anointing, and all of that. But we should not underestimate the place of personal prayer. Those five, ten minutes where you sincerely um, lift up those desires to God, you know? So I think we should incorporate this into our lives every day. Whenever you remember it, you know, um, probably you put the numbers somewhere in your house. And when you gave the statistics last Sunday, it was quite eye-opening for me. And um, if we can just, you know, consistently put this before us, it will guide us. So every day, whenever you do remember, just lift it up in prayers. Five minutes, ten minutes, it's going to go a very long way, you know, until when we are then come together as a church, probably on a weekly basis or whenever we do desire, and then pray for those prolonged hours to even make um, bigger impact. So, thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a great thought, Anula. Um, it's amazing how I remember seeing it sum once, and like a, a math sum, it was something like 367 times one. I, no, sorry, 365. So many days there are in a year. Times one equals 360. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm getting it wrong. Anyway, the point was. Um, that a little small incremental steps each day applied over a long period of time makes a massive, massive difference. So it's like sometimes we, we get a bit daunted at the size of a task, but how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And that's the same approach to this. Hudson Taylor, he said, pray as if everything depended on prayer and work as if everything depended on work. And I like that attitude. Because it's got to take both. Okay. Um, one question, let me ask it on your behalf, because you may be thinking about it, and it's, and it's this. You might be like, Dave, you stood up here three years ago, and you were like, well, our, our mission is like 100 by 100 baptisms. Where does this fit into that? And what, I, and I've been thinking about that. I'm like, Lord, well, what, are these like different pictures here or what? And, and the, the place I've came to, that I believe the Lord is leading us into is that, no, they're not different. They're one and the same. The, the dream of having 100 people baptized in one year, which is still crazy, albeit this year we've done 10 or more, 
is like, that's a beautiful dream, but it's massive. I believe that is like, that is like what's going to happen. But this is the how. This is like how you're going to get there. It's, it's the same road. It's the same journey. That might be the destination point. But the how is this, to give every single person in our community an opportunity to hear his heart. Listen, if we're doing that consistently, regularly, intentionally, with the Holy Spirit's power, we won't have to worry about the number of baptisms coming through this place. I believe that 100%. So, let's, um, we're just going to finish this morning. I know maybe time is going on a little bit, but I think it's really important to finish this morning with a time of communion. Because we need to realize that um, the best laid plans of mice and men there's nothing that we can achieve in our own strength, in our own power, or very little. We, we need to realize that we continually come to this cross. And in the place when we meet Jesus at the foot of the cross, and we just humbly accept his bread, the juice that symbolizes his blood and his body, that brings a transformative power into our lives when we realize that. So we're just going to share communion together. We're going to play a song in the background about being in the presence of the Lord. So, Lord Jesus, as I just, you know, we come to an end of this time together, with all things, we want to just submit them into your hands. We want your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And I just ask, Lord, that these plans that we've outlined today, Lord, if this is your heart, if this is your will, let it be so. Open the doors for it to happen. And if it isn't, Lord, close them. But Lord, we just want to give you your cross, the sacrifice that you paid for us, its rightful place this morning. And so I just pray as we just come, as we just eat and we drink this simple, simple meal, it will just remind us of the importance of staying in communion with you, of being in common union with our God. So Lord, even in these moments, bless us with your, a tangible sense of your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you that you, you were crushed, pierced for us. And we just thank you for that. We thank you now that we live on the other side of the cross, knowing your forgiveness and freedom. So thank you, Jesus. We'll go to end our service in a minute. Um, let me just give you one or two notices before we do. First one is this. Friday night, we have got Unite Youth. So Unite Youth. Now, this is like a citywide youth event held at King's Church, and they basically invite all the different youth groups from across Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire to come together. So I think there's about 20 different youth groups that come together. We're talking literally like a couple of hundred of young, young people that are going to be there. So it's at 7 p.m. this Friday.